we're in subperiod five. Uh, this uh, encompasses the years 1918 to 1941. Starts with the Cardinal Principles Report, finishes with the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese in 1941. I'm calling it the, the period of curriculum development and appraisal. This is the longest, at least in terms of the number of slides that you will have to view. I don't know if it will be the longest in terms of time. Sometimes these slides are short, sometimes they are long. Hopefully it will be about the same as the ones we have already uh, viewed and you've listened to. The times uh, were those bracketed by two wars. It was a depression and, a, and two wars on either side. It was a time of social experimentation. We tried universal suffrage. We gave all males the vote. Uh, pro excuse me, universal suffrage, that's females. We're giving females the vote. We also experimented with prohibition. Let's take that liquor away from them and you know it's no good. It was a period of contrasts. On one hand, we had the telephone, we had the radio, we had the airplane. On the other hand, we had gangsters, we had the Scopes trial, and we had the first of the Red Hunts. You're a communist. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And then came the Depression. Social efficiency was the order of the day. And it was in more than just the schools. The focal point was the well-being of society, not the individual. And the new comprehensive high school would equip, would equip each young citizen to function in a system run by orderly and efficient management. There were changes in the schools. Enrollments began to double each decade as more and more immigrants came to the country. More schools were needed in order to house those that chose to come to school. An increased demand for teachers in order to put someone in those classrooms. And then the beginnings of concern for, hey, these kids don't all learn the same way or at the same speed. I've got fast kids, I've got slow kids, I've got medium kids. I can't handle all of this. On top of that, there's a call for universal education. Now this probably derives somewhat from not wanting to put all those young kids to work the way some of the foreign countries still do. We want a place for them. That place is perhaps school. Many, many st states begin to pass compulsory attendance laws. I call them c compulsory attendance because that's all you can compel. You can't compel anyone to learn. But the big debate was, what are we going to teach them? Shall we have practical education for the masses? Or should we have liberal education for the few? Uh, which is best? More changes in the schools. Some of the subject fields realigned. Social studies coalesced out of history, civics, and sociology. Natural history split into biology, and then biology split into botany and zoology, and another animal, general science. The North Central Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools was created. This was the first accrediting body. Uh, remember that freeze plan at the University of Michigan? This is now the national or the natural extension of that. Let's have an organization which goes around and accredits schools. It was formed to maintain standards. We don't want any schools out there getting sloppy. We won't want them all to be of a good quality. The hero of the times was the businessman. 
The businessman was given credit for the prosperity and good times of the early 1920s. And these were good times. These are the, the roaring 20s. Schools sought to capture this business efficiency, scientific management image. Uh, schools, if nothing, are not imitative. If something is good in society, they want to be just like it. Uh, Frederick Douglass did his time management studies at the beginning of, of the century. Industry began to run itself on efficient an efficiency model, and the schools thought, wow, we can be just like that. Scientists began to become more popular, become more recognizable, and the schools thought, wow, we want to be just like that. And so the two kind of coalesce into business efficiency slash scientific management, and the schools wanted it. In the 17th yearbook, and I need to tell you about these now, the National Society for the Study of Education, that's what the NSSE stands for, uh, publishes, used to be one yearbook a year, now they publish more than one. Uh, back in the days of the 17th year book, there was one. Uh, usually these things are a gold mine for doctoral students because they contain a masterly summary of the state of the art of some aspect of education. Uh, when I was at Wisconsin, we had to uh, we had to know, and I'm going to forget the numbers of these now. Uh, there was the 29th year book, there was a 37th year book, and I think there was the 54th year book, which all had to do with science education, and so we digested those. There were other year books that dealt with the teaching of English, with uh, anything you can conceive, and there's probably a year book on it. The 17th year book was uh, devoted to the scientific movement in education. And in it, Edward L. Thorndike said, and this sounds trite now, whatever exists at all exists in some amount. Well, duh. To know it thoroughly involves knowing its quantity as well as its quality. So that kicked off the scientific movement in education. Curriculum was born as a field of study. A guy by the name of Franklin Bobbitt wrote two books on curriculum development, one in 1918, the other one in 1924. In his books, he popularized something known as activity analysis. You want to know what plumbers do? You go out into the real world and you find yourself some plumbers and you sit down and interview them and you ask, what do you do as part of your job? What are your activities? You then go back uh, to your classroom or your planning area and you design curricula to reflect what it is that the real people out in the real world do. And then you design teaching modules to have children learn the same things. David Snedden, remember David, he comes back and he comes back and he comes back. He's now at Teachers College Columbia. He also is an advocate of activity analysis as a means of curriculum and curriculum development. The late 1920s host an explosion of large scale curriculum development projects as every large city and most of the smaller ones try and design their own curriculum unique for their communities. Lots of consultant money, particularly for Bobbitt, Snedden, and a few others.